Hey, it's 8 o'clock. Um, I think it would be a good idea to do something this afternoon, um, because I, there are certain things I want to do, which I don't want to rush. Um, you can't rush them, because I can't rush them anyway, because with this kind of stuff you have to actually get into it and to connect with the experience, uh, which I find difficult. Even though I've been practicing for a long time, it's not easy to do. It's particularly difficult to do it with, with other people. It's quite, it's, bad, you know, it's not too bad on your own, um, but when you do it with other people and you've got all the, all the extra factors and it's quite difficult connecting with it. So I have to do it fairly slowly. Um, and also it's better for you if I do it fairly slowly um, because otherwise you, you can't connect with it. Um, so in order not to rush and run out of time towards the end of the week, I think it would be a good idea. Uh, this year, for the first time, I think it's in influence of the video, I've got a very definite idea about what I'd like to do by the end, get, get to by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. um, so there we are. I, I, I'm organised, Stefan. Organised. By an idea. Right? Yeah, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We shall be coming to that this afternoon. I just want to continue with what I was doing yesterday. Um, I was reading from this introduction. And I, uh, I won't be reading all the time. This, the whole week, don't worry about that. Um, but um, uh, this I do want to, to read and continue here. Um, and we may get through this whole part roughly by coffee, who knows. And then. Mm, anyway, I talked yesterday about how uh, we got into this thing which I call a hermeneutic approach. A hermeneutic approach instead of hermeneutic thinking as distinct from uh, systems thinking and all of that. And I, I did mention about that. Um, now, don't worry about it. This interest in hermeneutics led me quite naturally into phenomenology, the most important and influential movement in European philosophy in the 20th century. Hermeneutics, as the philosophy of meaning and understanding, was transformed by phenomenology, first through Heidegger and then through Gadamer, but getting into phenomenology isn't easy. It's a philosophy which has the effect of seeming strange and yet familiar at the same time. Phenomenology seems to take the ground away from under our feet, and yet at the same time gives us a sense of being where we have always been, only now recognising it for the first time. It's hard to catch hold of because it's like trying to catch a glimpse of something as it happens and is over before we know it. It has sometimes been described as like trying to catch a glimpse of yourself over your own shoulder. It can perhaps be described most simply as stepping back into where, you, into where we already are. So it's a peculiar motion. I wish to say that in phenomenology you don't go anywhere. It's a totally dynamic thing, but you don't go anywhere. You go into where you already are. Only you go into where you already are. So it's like what you do is you step back into where you are already. And in that moment of doing it, you recognise it. Which is where you were all the time, and now you recognise what it is. That's what phenomenology does. We'll understand this better as we go along. And you'll understand it, I hope, for the next part of what I'm going to do which is entitled uh, Catching Seeing in the Act. That's not what I'm doing now. Later on, uh, when I do it, I think you'll understand what this description <coughs> means of stepping back into where we already are. <clears throat> this means shifting the focus of attention within experience away from what is experienced into the experience of it. It's a we're going to this more, it's easy to misread that. So, if we consider seeing, for example, this means shifting attention from what we see into our seeing of it. We have to step back from what is seen into the seeing of what is seen. That's the important bit to say. You step back from what is seen into the seeing of what is seen. You don't focus on the seeing. If you focus on the seeing, we'll do this more this afternoon, 
you turn the seeing, seeing into a new what that's seen. You can't do that. So this is a trick that this is this is a stumbling block that people have. That when you shift attention, you shift it within experience. As we are, 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 are if we're if we're looking, I'm, 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 I look at this watch. I see this watch. My attention is focused on the watch, on what is seen. And in fact, I don't realise what's happening. We'll say we'll be going into this later. And what you do in phenomenology is you shift the position of attention within experience from what is seen into the seeing of what is seen. But not into the seeing period, because otherwise you turn the seeing into a new what, like the watch. And then you have the seeing of the seeing, and you get into a, a terrible mess. And that's the fallacy of introspection. Oh, excuse me, is that like you become an observer? No, you don't become an observer. It's very important. You don't become an observer. You'll see this this afternoon. I'm glad you brought that up, so don't worry. You don't actually become an observer. Um, if you, uh, in fact, the very opposite. If you shift attention within experience, then you don't become an observer. So I'll go back to that. I'm going to go into this anyway in, in, in some detail, so it'll become clear. In fact, I was just trying to amplify what I'd written here, um, because it is very difficult for people. Anyway, we shall certainly come, come to that. Um, don't worry about it. Um, make, uh, I was, never mind that. Like many others, I felt drawn towards phenomenology and yet frustrated by it. Because it seemed to be evident and elusive both at the same time. However, by good fortune, the stirring of my interest in phenomenology happened to coincide with the founding of the British Society for Phenomenology by Wolf Mays. This gave me the opportunity to meet and learn from practitioners, which included not only academic philosophers, but also psychiatrists, sociologists and others who used the phenomenological approach in their work. It was like breathing in an atmosphere of phenomenology, and under these circumstances, it wasn't long before I began to catch the phenomenological way of seeing. And you catch it. It's like catching a cold or something. Or catching something that happens. Did you catch that? It's like that. <clears throat> what happened was, I, um, this is right at the beginning of the 1970s. This is 1971, 1972. Um, so after the 1960s, because of work I've been doing then, I'll mention that later, in another context, I, I, I wanted to find out about phenomenology. I heard about this, and I had this instinct that this was that this is connected with what we were trying to do at that time. But I couldn't find anything out about it because there just simply wasn't anything. And the secondary literature was very, very poor. The primary translations were very, very difficult indeed to, to, to get into. So, so well, what happened was, uh, <coughs> my... Uh, my wife spotted an advert in the New Scientist for a conference on phenomenology and sociology at City University. And she said, why don't you go to that? I said, oh, I can't go to that. I always say no, you see. Um, so she always say no to everything first. I said, oh, no, I can't go, I can't go to that. Anyway, she, uh, well, I, I went. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I am... Um, as this turned out to actually be, unknown to me, the founding conference of this society, which had been set up by this philosopher Wolf Mays, who taught at Manchester, and he simply knew everybody in philosophy, in English-speaking philosophy and in European philosophy. And he felt that this kind of European philosophy was not represented at all in England and Scotland, and there were people who were interested, and so he started this British society for phenomenology. And it was absolutely fabulous because the people you met were, 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 it's not now, I'm still a member and I went to a conference two years ago, it's all different, it's now what they call mid-career academics and young academics. It, all, all, all the characters have gone because they've been, the whole thing's been academicized out. Um, there were psychiatrists, there were quite a number, and these were professional psychiatrists but they didn't work in universities. 
The main problem that happens is everything gets taken over by the bloody universities and it just ruins, through my language, it just ruins everything in the end. There's a place for universities, but they think that they're, they're the whole thing, you know. So there were psychiatrists who actually worked with people. There were a lot of, a lot of the psychiatrists and psychotherapists were associates of R.D. Lang. You may have heard of him. He was very famous at that time, uh, not later. Um, and they were very um, unusual people. There were um, people working in social administration who were doing the phenomenology of social administration. And at this conference, there were these, there were these blokes there. They were northerners. They were big men. They, they lived on pints of beer and pork pies. And they, they, weren't, they weren't the right kind of people at all. And th these people were working in Belfast, in the middle of all the trouble, and Liverpool doing social administration and doing it phenomenologically. And this is incredible, because these people were living phenomenology. So if you spent time with these people, then you, you got to... It, it's like you, you were soaking something up and you began to catch this way of seeing from, by osmosis from the people. And that's actually what happened to me, because I had a bit of luck. I went to this conference, and the key speaker, it's not on Friday night, and the, the key speaker, it was Friday night, Friday, Friday and Saturday, and the key speaker on Saturday morning, Raymond Aron from Paris, uh, had said that he couldn't come, for some reason, uh, probably fogging the channel. A continent cut off, sort of thing, you know. Uh, you know that story, never mind. Um, but he couldn't come. And uh, so that was a problem. And so they asked if there were any volunteers who would give a talk, or perhaps more than one person, and they wouldn't expect a prepared talk because they knew that nobody would have one. And there wouldn't be the usual kind of stringent criticisms and all that sort of business. People would be very lenient. Well, I was been doing this stuff, you see, I've, been, I've told you about this hermeneutic survey and this stuff in industry and so on and that. And I, I, we were in, and I was just full of this stuff. And I have no idea why, but I put my hand up. And that, that was that. Another chap did, he did something on mathematics as well. And the, now, it had a peculiar effect. Um, because I did that, um, people sort of were open to me and liked me, um, even before I gave the talk. And I, 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 everyone was happy to talk to me. It was great. I actually I, I went up to my room about 11.30 at night after the bar closed and sat down and started to prepare this thing. I wrote it down on this piece of paper that was folded all over the place. And I gave this talk the next morning. And uh, amazingly, um, they liked it. So I was in. It was fantastic. Um, and they asked me to go to their conference and give a full talk and so on, which I in Oxford, which I subsequently did. <coughs> it was an amazing thing. that They actually, they liked this, and that got me in. So I, I, I sort of was sort of, as it were, accepted by these people. And I was a physicist. They couldn't have given a damn, because there were all sorts of things, you see. And there was this, even the academics were open in those days. So it was a wonderful experience. And this was right at the beginning of the 70s. This is a period of time between 1968 and 1972, that Brian Goodwin thought was, was, was a real turning point. He thought that's when the golden age really was. And certainly an awful lot happened. We talked about this a fair bit. To both of us, key events happened in our lives between 1968 and 1972, and this was certainly one for me. But <laughs> I didn't know until later. God, talk about fools rush in with angels fear to tread. <laughs> I didn't know who Raymond Aron was. I knew he was some kind of sociologist. He'd written, there was a two-volume book on the history of sociology in Penguin by Raymond Aron. I knew that. But I had no idea that Raymond Aron was the man who introduced Jean-Paul Sartre to phenomenology. And that he was a major intellectual in the whole French scene. He was the man who took over Sartre's job, teaching job for a year, so Sartre could go to Berlin and study Husserl for a year. So and there's this famous story about... Uh, they were having a drink, Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre, as Raymond Aron. And Aron had just come from Berlin. And he told them about phenomenology. And he said Sartre went white. Because he, he said he realized 
you could do philosophy with street lamps, street lamps and wine glasses. <laughs> and that's what he wanted to do. Concrete was the philosophy of lived experience. And he said Sartre just went white with the emotion as he realised that he was, uh, he, this was an enormous temp. And it was Aaron who introduced him to this. So, yes, <laughs> No, no, physicist and not entity in philosophy put his hand up to substitute for him <laughs> well you see that's what happens when you're young these things happen to you because you're foolish and open and, and so on and that and it works sometimes it doesn't work but this worked wild horses wouldn't drag me into doing anything like that today if I was somewhere and someone said would anyone volunteer for something my hand would stay firmly down. That's because I'm experienced. So, uh, you know, there's something to be said for being young and not being experienced. There also is something to be said for being experienced. But and that's actually how I got into phenomenology in this remarkable way. And so, it was... Uh, oh, some of the people were just fantastic. And we actually all got on so well. It was amazing. It was just like breathing in phenomenology. It was amazing. You can't get that from books. <clears throat> it was against this background that I was asked to give a series of workshops on phenomenology and hermeneutics at a new residential adult education centre. It's called the International Academy for Continuous Education. And it was set up by the man I mentioned before, J.G. Bennett, for whom I'd worked for a number of years in the 60s. The aim... Excuse me. Ooh. The aim was not to fill the students' heads and notebooks with intellectual material on what this or that philosopher said, but to bring them to the point where some of them at least could begin to get a taste of this way of seeing for themselves. It seemed like an excellent opportunity. However, there were a number of drawbacks, not least of which was the fact that I had the faintest idea how to do it. But, overcome by the enthusiasm of youth again, it became a case of the proverbial fool rushing in where angels would fear to tread. I simply hoped that I would get a clearer idea of how to proceed with these workshops the nearer it got to the time. But this didn't happen. And my anxiety level began to rise the closer it got. The closer it got, the closer it got. Especially when I learned that I would be expected to take three different groups of adult students, each for two sessions a week for a total of 12 weeks. <coughs> Thankfully, with a break after the first six weeks. When I took up residence at the college the day before I was due to begin, I went for a walk in the countryside in the hope that this might at least have the effect of reducing the level of anxiety I was now experiencing. I made my way to the bottom of the valley through which a small, clear river ran. I stood on a bridge, looking downstream at the river flowing away from me. For some reason, this made me feel uneasy, and I crossed to the other side to look at the river flowing towards me. This felt better. And I spent some time there, looking upstream. I began to be drawn into the experience of looking, plunging with my eyes into the water flowing towards me. When I closed my eyes, I sensed the river streaming through me. And when I opened them again, I found that I was experiencing the river flowing towards me outwardly and through me inwardly at the same time. The more I did this, the more relaxed and free from anxiety I began to feel. But of course, the moment eventually came for the first workshop to begin. I remember walking down the long corridor towards the room where it was to take place, feeling I was about to be extinguished. The door at the end was closed. The students were already waiting inside. And as I turned the doorknob to go in, I expected to fall into an abyss on the other side. Instead, as I walked into the room, I heard myself saying with surprising confidence, our problem is that where we begin is already downstream. And in our attempts to understand where we are, 
we only go further downstream. What we have to do instead is learn how to go back upstream and flow down to where we are already so that we can recognize this as not the beginning but the end. That's phenomenology. I don't know who was more surprised, myself or the students. <laughs> it was a good beginning, a doorway into the movement of thinking in phenomenology through which after that I found, found I could begin to go. And for me that was the turning point. Uh, that was the real doorway and that was it. Um, and that is, what, that is how I see phenomenology. And this, is, this, then, this then functions as a leitmotif musical term, isn't it, uh, throughout the whole of the book I've written, the upstream, downstream thing. So I'm now going to illustrate this, I'm going to illustrate this, um, well we're going to be spending the whole rest of the week on this, but not just in phenomenology because uh, it turns out, and I'll come to this later, why, why I'm doing this, it turns out that the same dynamic of thinking is present in Goethe's approach to the plant and so on and that that I'll come to later, so we shall be doing that. Um, but the first part is harder because we're having to work with experience itself directly. And after, in a moment, we're going to look at something in particular, uh, and then later we shall go into this whole business of, uh, of the lived experience of seeing in this phenomenological way. And that will give us two direct examples. The first example, is, as I've got here, we can, we can illustrate this by considering the act of distinguishing. So we're going to look at distinguishing, the act of distinguishing. So we'll also read this at Bonk because it's actually quite difficult to get. And seeing is easy because with, with seeing we can work quite directly with something, but with distinguishing we can't. Um, but when we come to seeing, we can have fun. It's a sort of fun, anyway. It's what passes for fun in philosophy. Right? <laughs> You're right with the window. Yes, times. Thank you. Yes. We can illustrate this by considering the act of distinguishing. I'm reading this because um, because it works. I know it works because I've been told it works. Um, a few years ago, I did this. The first time I'd done it. And uh, it was 2006, and there was a woman, Anne, from Norway via Malta, mm -hmm. and she picked up on it, and she said this was, a, listening to the language was an exercise in attention, an attentive listening, that if you listen to the language, the move, put your attention into the language, the movement of the language carries the movement of the idea. And that's how you enter into the idea through the movement of the language. And she, she, she found that and she, she, she commented on it quite a bit and people picked it up. So that's, that's one reason why I do this. When we think of the act of distinguishing, we think of this in terms of the outcome. Now I've got that completely wrong. I'll start again. When we think of this in terms of the outcome, we cannot avoid thinking of distinction only in terms of difference. That one thing is different from another. And the movement of thinking here is one which almost automatically turns distinction into separation. So we come to think that distinction and separation are the same. But they are not. We can see that they are not. We can see that they are not the same by trying to go upstream into the act of distinction itself, which means going into the happening, <clears throat> the coming into being, which is the appearing of distinction, the appearance of distinction, the appearance taken verbally. Uh, you know the word appearance in English can be used as a noun. The appearance of something. What's that look like? What it looks like? That's called the appearance of it or appearance, which is appearing, happening, okay? So when I say appearance, often in the book I, um, I italicize the ants, so that people will actually, though I have, haven't done here, I've done the whole word, so that people will realize you've got to read this verbally. 
So, what did I just say there? We can see that they're not the same by trying to go upstream into the act of distinction itself, which means going into the happening, the coming into being, which is that's hyphenated, which is the appearance of distinction. We could call this dynamical distinction the primary distinction, as opposed to the secondary distinction, which merely partitions and separates what has already been distinguished. When we go upstream and try to catch distinction in the act, we discover something fundamental, which we overlook when we begin downstream with what is distinguished. When we shift our attention into the happening, which is the appearing of distinction, we notice that distinction not only differences, but at the same time, it also relates. Mm -hmm. It is when we focus only on the difference, as we do when our attention is focused on what is distinguished, the outcome, instead of the act itself that we confuse distinction with separation. I'm going on, I mean, just as an introduction to it. <coughs> if you don't get it yet, don't worry. <coughs> I've used the word differences, the distinction differences. Now, we don't say that in English. We don't say differences. But in fact, um, sometimes, you, you, I've got a footnote here on this, which is quite fun, so I'll read this. Well, I wonder if I can find it. Well, I've lost the footnotes. <coughs> well, is that... Oh, here we are. Yeah. Got it. <coughs> the term, the use of differences in a verbal manner may at first cause difficulty for some. And the same goes for differencing, which will also be used later, differencing. So I might as well get this over now. Differences and different things. A precedent for this may be the use of presences and presencing, which is now commonplace in discussions of Heidegger's philosophy, although there are some who continue to find this objectionable. I have this problem with the wholeness of nature. I use those terms. And they put the book out to a, an editor in Kentucky. And... Um, he got very annoyed by this and crossed it out. And I said, look, you know, this is how it's used by Heidegger, and everyone talking about Heidegger. And his reply was, who the hell is Heidegger anyway? <laughs> I realised then what I was up against. <laughs> uh, anyway, I got my way. I got my way by saying, by getting to the name published and saying, I'm not having this. I spent years on this book. If I meet someone who simply doesn't even know that, and he's editing it, then I'm withdrawing my book from your from publication. That that did the trick. It always it always does. You know, Craig Holridge is coming. He threatened to sue the publisher. But he did what he did. The publishers are a drag, actually. <coughs> they think they know what they're doing, and they don't. And we know they don't know what they're doing because so many books are remaindered. Do you have that abroad in your countries? Remaindered books. You don't have that. Right. I don't know what it is. Well, what it is is this: there are bookshops all over the UK, remain the books. They're brand new books that are being published, and no one wants to buy them. No. And so they sell them off for a pound a time or something like that. And this is because the publishers get it wrong. They think they know what they're doing, and they're so pleased with themselves. And actually, they haven't got a clue. They've got no judgment whatsoever. And they try to they call it creative marketing. They try to foresee what people will want, prejudge what people will want. And of course, it's what they and their friends would want. So they, 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 there are famous books which have been rejected over and over and over and over again by publishers. You know the guy I was given, the name guy I was suggested to Lovelock by William Golding, the Nobel Prize winning novelist. You may not have heard of him, but he won the Nobel Prize. And he lived just down here next to Lovelock. He was the one who suggested to love not the word Gaia. They met in the post office, so the apocryphal story goes. Anyway, Golding was famous for a book called Lord of the Flies. Now, that book was rejected by everybody, and the publisher who actually published it rejected it. 
And the reader who read it said it was infantile and no one would be interested and chucked it in the rubbish bin. A new reader came in and went to what they call the trash pile. That was it. And actually said, I think this book is quite interesting. And that's how it got published. So it's entirely accidental that this book, which made him famous, ever got published in the first place. Now it's studied in schools and all over the place. Not that that does any good. But this is the thing that publishers just don't know what they're doing. So, for those of you who get involved with publishers, uh, when they start going on, you making out how important they are and how, how much they understand, just, just say to yourself, like when you're dealing with a politician, why is this bastard lying to me? <laughs> <laughs> you know that story. <laughs> no, we won't get that story. <laughs> it's worth knowing. Claude Cockburn was a journalist on the Times in the 1930s, a very famous journalist. He won a prize for um, anyone here from Chile. That's all right. He won a prize for the most boring headline for the Times there could be. And he won it with small earthquake in Chile, not many dead. <laughs> not very nice. <laughs> he won the prize. And he, he, was, he was very much into politics. Um, and he was a Marxist. And he was the only Marxist that ever been on the Times. He was a top journalist. And he used to get a lot of political meetings. And he used to say, you listen to these politicians. And he's a wonderful man. And he comes across, he's so sincere. And you say, gosh, what this guy is saying is really good. It's really interesting. He's really got something. At that point, say to yourself, why is this bastard lying to me? <laughs> because you need to do that to, get, to save yourself from being taken in. Right? Very good advice <laughs> for many things in life, including <coughs> publishers. <coughs> now, normal language use often focuses more on the noun than the verb. The static instead of the dynamic. But when it is the latter which needs to be emphasised, then it may be useful to introduce an unfamiliar and therefore at first awkward term which is more dynamic. I have noticed that, although they may look more awkward on the printed page, these more dynamic terms are usually readily accepted when spoken. In fact, I often just use them as a matter of course without comment. On one occasion when I did make a comment, Nigel Topping, a mature student on the Masters in Holistic Science program at Schumacher College, pointed out that, as we can go from dance to dancing, so we could just as easily go from difference to differencing. This may not satisfy the voice of the schoolmaster echoing in my ear, but I'm going to ignore that because the schoolmaster doesn't know about the needs of philosophical work. And as Nigel Topping, you remember that? And I told him, I was so thrilled at that, I said to him, Nigel, I'm going to give you a reference in my book. And I told you, uh, I've done it. <laughs> That's the only reason why I read that, actually. He said dance to dancing because at that time I, 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 I at that time I, I, I used to do the geriatric tango. I used to dance the tango for five years. I did the tango geriatrically, and uh, uh, that, that was it. So he, you know, so he thought he thought I'd understand dance and dancing. So you can go from difference to differencing, and it, well, obviously it's not word, but it's a way of smoothing it over. So I'm talking about differences, which is a verb, and I'm going to talk about differencing, which is also a verb, and I need to do that because it, it's, it's dynamic. <coughs> the key is in the word from. Well, we say that A is distinguished from B, or that X is distinguished from its surroundings which thereby become the background against which X stands out as being X. We must remember here that we are describing the very act of distinction. And so we must not fall into the trap of thinking of A and B, or X and its surroundings, as if they were already there as such, so that the distinction would amount to no more than separating what is already distinguished. In which case, we are already too late in our thinking to catch the distinction in the act. The word from not only indicates difference, 
but it also indicates relation. If A is distinguished from B, or X from not X, the surroundings, then the very act of distinction, which the very act of distinction which differences simultaneously relates. If that is, if A is distinguished from B, it is thereby concomitantly related to B by the very act which distinguishes it. The very way of referring to A refers to it in terms of B. Since this relation is intrinsic to the distinction, part of the distinction, and is not added af afterwards, it is called an internal relation. This is very important to modern philosophy, the whole idea of internal relations. External relations are when you have separate things and you connect them by a third thing. Here, no third thing is needed. The connections are intrinsic. It is as if from goes in opposite directions simultaneously. Distinguishing is a dual movement of thinking which goes in opposite directions at once. In one direction it differences, whereas in the other direction it relates. So, the act of distinction The act of distinction differences slash relates. Now, it does not differences and relates. Not differences and relates. I'll explain that. If it differences and relates, would be two movements. A movement of differencing and a movement of relating. That's the and. This is not two movements. It's one movement which goes in two opposite directions simultaneously. It's a movement which differences and relates. The differencing is the relating. The relating is the differencing. The start of the differencing. Um, and it is in fact what comes into being as a distinction is therefore a difference relation, a difference, <coughs> a difference relation, a distinction equals a difference slash relation. That's what a distinction is. <coughs> the act of distinction <coughs> is a unitary act. You see what I mean by that? Oh, Lord. <coughs> unitary act which differences relate. Right. The act of distinction is a unitary act which differences relates. And I put this uh, brace round it, um, and I do that um, whenever I 
because there's several, lots of different cases of this. Whenever I'm dealing with what I call a unitary act, I put a brace around it. That means that that act is one whole. You must not, under any circumstances, put an and in there, because then it would not be one whole. It's a unitary act. The differencing is the relating. Uh, we need... Uh, If the relation, which is intrinsic to the distinction, is not noticed, and it usually isn't, we think of it purely in terms of difference, <coughs> then the distinction can only turn into separation. Which is what happens when our attention shifts from the distinguishing of what is distinguished to focus on what is distinguished. Hard, isn't it? We have to go upstream and our attention is on the distinguishing of what is distinguished. Then, then downstream we see what is distinguished. We focus on what is distinguished. We no longer notice the act of distinguishing. We focus on what is distinguished on the object. And that's, it, it, we're seeing again and again, this is intrinsic to the movement of experience. There's nothing wrong with this. We can't help doing this. Experience is, by its very nature, a vector. It's directional. It's centrifugal. It goes outwards. And it cannot be otherwise. But if we try to understand experience in terms of the end of the experience, the result that we're focused on, what is distinguished, then we won't even understand what that is. Because we have not seen the coming into being of what is distinguished in the act of distinguishing. So we then see distinction simply as difference and hence as separation. We don't notice that within the distinction there is intrinsically a relation. In other words, the amazing thing is it turns out that we get into the dynamics that distinction is intrinsically holistic because there is a relation in here. Now, no one would ever think of distinction as being holistic. You would say distinction is the archetypal analytical thing. Separation, separation, separation. It's the very archetype of the analytical is distinction. Oh, if only we didn't make distinctions, then we would see the wholeness, except, except all this stuff we go on about. So, it's because we haven't noticed what distinction is, because we focused on the result of the distinction, the distinction that's made, instead of on the coming into being of that distinction in the act. And in the act we discover, if you distinguish A from B, then you thereby relate A to B. The relationship is internal to the distinction. So a distinction is a difference slash relation, not a difference. Now, this is a terrifically important thing to recognize when you follow the coming into being distinction that it is holistic. It's not something we would have expected to find, not in a month of Sundays. And, uh, sometimes I've not done this this year, but some years I, I uh, stress this thing. I say that the problem with wholeness is it's ubiquitous. Wholeness is everywhere. There's an awful lot of it about it's just that we don't notice it. It's right under our eyes, right under our noses all the time. It's right in front of our eyes all the time. But we don't notice it. Now, we don't notice it because of the way in which we're looking. Because we're focused on the end product of the process and not on the coming into being. Move upstream into the coming into being and you then discover the wholeness which is there already in experience. <clears throat> we tend to think of wholeness as something frightfully special, uh, as something that's got to be found in certain areas, um, uh, or something that only very special people find, and so on, and that includes us, of course. <laughs> and so on, very constant. Uh, to be a group of very special people. But <laughs> and it's not true. It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous to experience. It's why the subtitle of my book is, and it's two days running now, I was saying, it's going to be. <laughs> discovering the wholeness of lived experience. The wholeness is upstream. It's astonishing. You have to go to the dynamics of beings, what I call the dynamics of beings. 
If you don't go into the dynamics, you don't find the holus. What you get is another kind of holus. You can focus on that and so on, but you'll never miss, you'll never discover the primary holus because it's upstream. Everyone in this room will be sure the distinction means separation. Distinction is the opposite of holus. And yet the holus is there in the distinction already. There's nothing new in this. What I'm doing is virtually what Hegel does uh, about 1805 or something like that. It's actually, I, I didn't get this from Hegel. I got this from a different kind of thing altogether. But later I discovered this is all there in Hegel. And people who know about Hegel know about this. The whole idea of internal relations, that, that comes from Hegel. Um, this, uh, so I would say this is well known. This is one of those things that's well known that nobody knows about. It. It's paradoxical, isn't it? It's not new, it's just that it's unnoticed. But it may be helpful to have an image of this simultaneity of what seems to be opposites. Because I've talked about difference relation, differences relates. I've also now talked about description, uh, distinction as being holistic, as well as being analytic, of course. It is actually... <coughs> It's actually, I have to say, it's, it's analytic, holistic. Now again, there's no and. The, the analytic is holistic. The holistic is analytic when you see it's the same thing. Now we need an image to help us with this, it's a bit, a bit difficult. And, I've got one, I'm going to be using this later, but I'm not going to do it now, because it means rigging that thing up. So I'll just do a little one here and hope my artistic skills are up to it today. Yippee! <laughs> That's what we need. This is a by, by, a by, a bi-perspectival. I'm trying to say bi-perspectival figure. Familiar from Gestalt psychology with that rabbit. This is not duck and rabbit. This is not duck and rabbit. There is no and. This is a duck rabbit. It is what I've been doing. Duck Rabbit. It is simultaneously duck, simultaneously rabbit. You get one or the other, and you. Well, this um, it's not a case of partly one and partly the other. It's not partly duck and it's not partly rabbit. It's wholly duck and wholly rabbit. So these kind of distinctions are like that. It's wholly difference and it's wholly relation. The difference is the relation. The relation is the difference. This is how there can be a dual movement. It, it's differencing relating. You can't have the one without the other. You can't have the, you can't have the difference <coughs> at that level without the relation. <coughs> Sorry, uh, chest. Uh, how are we doing? Okay. So one movement, which is simultaneously both, is, is like that. Oh, it gets a bit easier now. And time. Uh, these, uh, these duck rabbit thingies, I use them a lot. Um, it's, uh, this duck rabbit in the reversing tube and so on, there's an awful lot that can be gained from contemplating these figures. People dismiss them as little visual tricks. The Gestalt psychologists use them, they found them extremely useful. But people say, oh, it's just subjective, or it's just something to do with the brain. Oh, if you only understood the brain, we'd explain that. What's the point of explaining it? Uh, who cares how it happens? Well, the point is, what is the experience of that duck rabbit? It's wholly duck, it's wholly rabbit. It's not, you see that, it's not duck and rabbit. So it's wholly both in a special way. And that's the way we need in our thinking. So this kind of, your own, if you were actually go into your own experience of looking at the duck rabbit, 
you can gain, you can act as a, a template for thinking in a new way. Uh, that was the, the phrase was used by David Bowe. Uh, he was very keen on the idea that there are templates for thinking. Of course, what happens is people then take the template as, as the thing they, they identify with the template, and everything goes wrong. This happens, of course, when people have done that with quite a lot of bones who have misunderstood what he was doing. <coughs> Excuse me. But as if someone asked you what you have been listening to, and um, a coffee break, and you said, oh, we just had a talk on the duck rabbit. Something like that. You see, that's what goes wrong. We haven't had a talk on the duck rabbit. The duck rabbit is introduced as a template for thinking. <coughs> the happening of distinction. <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> The happening of distinction is the appearing of what is distinguished. It actually appears in the happening of distinction. It is well known that when something is first distinguished, it soon appears to all who are able to see it. Whereas previously, it had not been seen by anyone, even though once it has been distinguished, we feel it was there to be seen all along, and we are astonished that nobody actually did see it. The medical disorder of muscular dystrophy provides an illustration of this. Before the 1850s, when this disease was first described, and that means when it was first distinguished, when you describe something, a, a, describing is an act of distinction. And that's actually how I got into this in the first place. Because in the 1960s I had a research fellowship which was investigating the description of experience with regard to time, our experience of time, in the present moment. And it was all about learning to work with description and to avoid explanation. Because all explanations are actually built on prior descriptions. And if the descriptions carry with them certain things which are not actually our, our assumptions or also themselves brought in from theories and so on and that, then those descriptions, if you then build an explanation on them, you can go very wrong indeed if those descriptions are not really appropriate for the phenomena. We are interested in this because this is what happened, particularly in physics. This is what happened. The great problem here, and I'm going back a long time now, before the recent discussions, but this is what happened in quantum physics uh, with the problem of the two-state interference experiment and so on. The question was how can that, how to describe that experiment without actually bringing in various assumptions and so on and that. Um, but as I say, we were doing this particularly with regard to the description of time, time and experience and so on. So there's a kind of, uh, this was very much also under the influence of the later Wittgenstein, uh, who had a huge influence. He died in 1953, but he had a huge influence in Britain uh, throughout the 50s and the, throughout the 60s, um, because Wittgenstein was very keen on this thing that you actually start, what counts first of all is description, and you have to learn to see, you have to learn to describe. Seeing and describing for him became the same, and you must avoid explanation and what he called about the tyranny of generalisation and so on. He thought that this introducing explanation was the wrong thing to do. And if you looked at your descriptions, you found you brought in all sorts of theoretical terms, terms from theories and explanations, which you, you were convinced were part of the phenomenon. So then you explore the phenomenon until you found that actually those things are not there in the phenomenon. You have brought them in. And this is a very, very, very exacting discipline. And I, I worked for this man, as a guest, this man, J.G. Bennett, uh, who wasn't going to let me or anyone get away with it. It was very, very exacting indeed. Uh, very, very wearing to do. Um, but of course, when later I came to phenomenology, I realised actually we've been doing phenomenology for several years without knowing it. It was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so description, but for me, uh, it was a daily experience was this business, working with description. And that's when I realised that describing is distinguishing. And that therefore, what's important is the act of distinction. And uh, later on, towards the, I'll mention this later, towards the end of the 60s, this took on a whole new meaning when something else came in, which was quite astonishing, really. But 
Um, so uh, I, I, this is not a trivial thing uh, to say uh, that uh, when this disease was first described, that is, it was dis first distinguished, it's the same thing. When this <coughs> di disease was first described by Duchenne, <coughs> it had not been recognized by anyone. That's in the 1850s. But once distinguished, what had not been seen before began to be widely recognized. And by the 1860s, many hundreds of cases had been seen and described. This prompted Charcot to comment. Charcot was the man uh, in Paris. He taught Sigmund Freud. Freud went to Paris and learned from Charcot, very famous psychiatrist. This prompted Charcot to comment, quote, how come that a disease so common, so widespread, and so recognizable as a glance, a disease which has always existed, how come that it is only now, it is only recognized now, why did we need Monsieur Duchesne to open our eyes. This question here, this astonishment and so on, is because this, this in itself tells us that there's something very fundamental going in here in this kind of primary distinct description which distinguishes something for the first time. And when it's distinguished, it appears. <coughs> and it, where, if, where I said I do at the top there, the happening of distinction is the appearing of what is distinguished. Most people say, oh, come, come now, surely. It's there already. When you say, oh, it's there already, you've already thought of it as being there already, I as being already distinguished. This is what we do. We take, we, we push the, we think in terms of things already distinguished before we distinguish them. And that's the trick here. So when, when you get an example like this from Charcot's comment on Duchenne, it sort of hits you in the face and you think, yes, terrific. That makes it visible what we're trying to say. Being able to recognize it, it depends on the primary act of distinguishing muscular dystrophy so that it stands out. What we later consider to have been there in front of us all the time is invisible to us before it is distinguished. We could say that the act of distinction bears it. And then we think, oh, it's there. <laughs> It is because it's been there by the act of distinction, which is the act of description. <clears throat> I have to say, it still has the same effect on me, this stuff does. I mean, when I was getting into this stuff, and that's in the 60s, this is, I, mean, it's, uh, I, I just thought it was just so amazing. I wanted to tell people about it, but you couldn't find any way in which I could get this across. Because you have to go into it, you have to do it, and you have to get into it, and it can take quite a lot of time. And you get into the doing it, and then what happens? It's like something switching on. It's like you plugged in, and suddenly you see what I'm talking about. Because when I write this stuff, I actually write it from the ceiling. I don't, so it takes me a long time. And I have to get myself into the point where I'm seeing what I'm writing, and then I write from the seeing itself. And that means that if someone reads it attentively, is that the word, attentively? then in fact they have a chance of this beginning to happen, seeing beginning to happen to them. That's how it's, the whole book is meant to be a practical exercise. It won't be noticed as that people think, it, think it's a new theory. It is nothing of the kind. It's actually an exercise. Um, this is, this is, my, this is, people don't realise that, that language itself can be used in a special concrete way in which it actually is an exercise in the movement of attention and so on like and that. That's why it's done in this way. It's also why sometimes I read it. Cause it's very hard to actually connect sometimes with this just, just like that. So, uh, now, I'm going to, What time is it? Uh, I've got another quarter of an hour, have I? Mm -hmm. Right. We're going to go back to 1802. <laughs> <coughs> We could also describe the unitary act of differencing relating as an act of articulation. If something is articulated, it has clearly differentiated parts which are related. The very word articulation con 
gains in the idea of difference and relation. As someone who is articulate in speech, we say, oh, he's very articulate, isn't he? <coughs> someone who is articulate in speech is able to speak distinctly and coherently. Difference, relation. Mm -hmm. That's what articulation means. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and therefore, when it comes to description, articulate description, we should find exactly the same thing here. And this brings us to uh, Luke Howard. Yes. Luke Howard. Seminal essay entitled On the Modification of Clouds. Now Howard was a very shy, retiring young man when he was 30. He was a chemist. <coughs> and for years and years and years he'd had this obsession with the clouds. That was there some way of describing the clouds that actually showed their, 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 their inner formation, their shape, their form. Um, and he, 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 I've forgotten all the details now, I used to know him back in the lot, but he actually looked upon nature and the clouds, yes he did, I've forgotten that, as a face, as a face, yes that's important. Sorry, I'm doing some work at the moment, on, again on the later Wittgenstein's work on seeing and faces, and that's a wonderful example there. Sorry, not in handkerchief to write down later. He saw, he saw the clouds <coughs> as a face. Um, and so it was really the physiognomy of the clouds, which is also interesting in terms of Goethe. Uh, and, <coughs> and he gave this talk in 1802 in a, a, a basement laboratory. Lots of little laboratories all over the place in those days. 1800 and so on. This is the time when science was really taking off, but really becoming a very alive thing. It hadn't yet become the big institutional thing, you know. It's a really wonderful period time for science. And this was in um, Plough Court, which is in the city of London, just off Lombard Street, in case you want to know. And in this basement, he was giving a lecture at six o'clock on the modification of clouds. And it had been well advertised by various people who thought his work was important. And a lot of older people had come along to see it. And they were a bit impatient for him to get on with it. Because I, he, they had to be over at Somerset House, which is on the stand there by uh, the bridge, Waterloo Bridge, uh, by 8 o'clock for a meeting of the much more prestigious Royal Society. And on top of that, they got dinner as well there, and they didn't want to be late for their dinner. So they wanted him to get on with it. And they were, you know, they'd been persuaded to go. It was said that, several of them said that, that they never forgot that event afterwards. It lived in their memory. Because what he did was he described the formation of the clouds and he simply introduced this, this language with which we are so familiar now, the simple classification of cloud formations, cirrus, <coughs> cumulus, stratus. You all know these terms for the clouds. And that was all that there was in then, of course, the extra one, the rain cloud, the nimbus. And, that's the, and this is what he did. Now, <coughs> to us, this sounds so deadly dull it's like stamp collecting or something. Well, stamp collecting might be more interesting than this. Um, or, you see, well, what's that? What's to make a fuss about that? All he's done is he's stuck some labels on the clouds. What's, what's the fuss about that? But that is not how people saw it at the time. Uh, that's not how Goethe saw it. One reason was because people for some time had been trying to understand the formation of clouds and understand this question of, are there distinct cloud types? Or are there as many different cloud types as there are clouds? Or are there no cloud types at all? Or if there are any cloud types, how many are there? Hmm. They weren't referring to the fact that uh, this was something just simply labels invented by a human being to stick on clouds. They had the sense that there were distinct types in the clouds. And he comes up and says, yes, there are cloud types and there are three. And that's astonishing. So, uh, when Goethe read a translation of Luke Howard's seminal essay on the modification of clouds, he said that Howard was, quote, the man who distinguished cloud from cloud. That's perfect. Goethe the poet understands exactly what to say. He distinguished cloud from cloud. So there are the difference, that he differenced them and thereby related them. 
This is an act of difference in relating. This is an extraordinary act, unitary act of difference in relating. Goethe picks it up in his very words. <coughs> and he wrote a poem in honour of Howard. Because um, Goethe had for years himself been trying to do this and had not succeeded. So when he came across Howard's essay, he was astonished. Uh, there's another one of these apocryphal stories. Um, he, he was in a coach at the time and he read reading it and he called for the coach to be stopped and wrote this poem and so on. There's a similar story about Darwin in the coach at the time and he called for the coach to be stopped. They always seem to be stopping coaches when they had inside. <laughs> Um, and he, in the poem, he said, Howard had defined the doubtful, fixed its limit line, and named it fitly. It may seem extraordinary to us today that Howard's simple classification of cloud formations, cirrus, cumulus, stratus, could be the source of so much scientific excitement and widespread admiration. At the time, it was quickly recognised that Howard had opened the door to the scientific study of meteorology which others had tried to find and failed. But now we would look upon this as if he did no more than impose a system of classification simply by applying labels externally to the superficial appearances of the clouds. But this is because we begin downstream with the end result, the system of names. That's where we begin. It's over when we begin. Instead of going upstream into the process of discovery, to glimpse the coming into being of the distinction of which these names are the expression. <clears throat> How could anyone find a natural order in the ever-changing phenomena of the clouds? The very idea of finding anything fixed and constant in such a fluid and impermanent phenomena seems at first absurd. Yet Howard was able to discern the hidden dynamics of the clouds and thereby distinguish three fundamental cloud types, which he said are as distinguishable from each other as tree from hill, or hill from lake. He was now able to show that the teeming myriads of cloud formations are all modifications of only three types, where we might have expected to find a multitude, or even none at all. Three types forming and transforming into one another according to the atmospheric conditions. As Goethe and others recognised, Howard distinguished the cloud formations, not in the sense of classifying them according to secondary characteristics, but in a unitary act of difference in relating, in which the types are seen as simultaneously different from and dynamically related to one another. We could say that in both senses Howard articulated the clouds, because distinguishing and naming are two sides of the same coin. This example shows clearly that the act of distinction is simultaneously analytic and holistic. <clears throat> Although, as we have seen, when we begin at the end it seems to result in no more than a division into separate categories, different spores apart into separation. When we try to catch distinction in the act, we find that it is not divisive but holistic. Thus, when he distinguished cloud from cloud, wonderful phrase, distinguished cloud from cloud, Howard simultaneously revealed the dynamic wholeness of the phenomenon, as Goethe clearly recognised. <coughs> well, I read through the last bit quite quickly, because I thought you got the point already by the time we got there. Uh, but I know why I did this, because then I want to stick up. I know what I want to stick up next. And that's a perfect timing point, because I straight to the break, we're going, we're going back to Heidegger. We always go back to Heidegger. Right. Is that okay? Is that a problem for anyone? <coughs> is, can you follow what I've been doing? Is it too difficult? Is it horrible? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot. The, the cloud thing is the closest to working for me. I start to see it, and I, then I realize that I was taught the cloud thing incorrectly. Hmm as if they were a series of objects. Mm. And I don't really understand how they transform into each other <coughs> because I wasn't taught no. the but transformations. The, I think the main thing here is to see that the actual naming itself has this quality of difference in relating. 
I, I, I went a bit far in what I said there, actually. And then when I was reading it, I thought, I'm going too far in terms of what I've done here by talking about that. I might change that later. Well, it's real. I mean, to me, I have to have something... Hmm. Yeah. Or it's a, yeah. Well, that's right. I agree with you. Um, I spent a lot of time with Howard's thing um, when I first came across this. It was in the early seventies. Uh, I came across this work of Howard's, and it quite knocked me out. Um, and I did actually give several talks on it, which was about this act of distinction. I was trying to work it out because what I cared about was I just saw this thing. He's doing what everyone would say was the archetypal analytical separate thing, just sticking labels on things. Um, we're holistic and that's, we know that's the really, really bad thing to do. But what he's actually doing isn't like that at all. We haven't understood what he's doing. When we understand it, we see there's this holistic side to it. <coughs> and that grabbed me. I thought that was amazing. Because again, I, just, I always just had this feeling that the, a lot of the people who went on about wholeness didn't really know what they were talking about. They got hold of this systems thing. and they, I'm going to talk about this afterwards as well. Um, that it was a subtle thing. The wholeness is there in the distinction. Distinction is holistic. It's marvellous. You know? um, and uh, but, and I agree with you, it is hard. You have to find um, it's hard. you have to find ways you can latch on to it. So whatever works for you, you follow that up. Um, whatever it is that works for you. It's another example of not seeing before distinguishing when it said, I don't know if this is true, but it said that when Columbus sailed to the Americas, the native people in the Americas couldn't actually see the ships. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, that's uh, always fascinating, yeah, though I yeah. don't know much about it. Yeah, that's very if they, good. If it's true or not. No, that's very good indeed. That's marvellous what you've just said. This is going to come in later uh, in, in, mm. in the work on seeing. And I'll bring that example in then because actually that's terrific. We can go into that. That's a really good. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why I've written this book is I actually think giving talks on this is hopeless. <laughs> it's hopeless for you. It's hopeless for me. It's just too difficult. You know, giving talks on physics is easy. Physics might be hard, quantum electrodynamics might be hard, but at least you can just focus on the mathematical equations and write them down on the board. You don't actually have to get into the experience. No matter how hard physics is, it's actually easier than doing this. But this is easier in some ways, because you don't have to do all that mathematics stuff. But actually it's very hard, because you've got to get into it, you've got to get into the, into the experience of it. This is very difficult. And you, all you can do is keep plugging away and come at it in one direction and another direction. So you're doing this, and suddenly you you hear you hear someone says, "Ah!" Oh. And you think, "Oh God, I wish I'd experienced that." Ah, oh, because I'm talking, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's not quite as bad as that, but you know, and you realise that sometimes ah, oh, you realise that somebody's latched onto it at that moment, and it's like one of those gestalt things. Suddenly it's there, and then it's gone again. Mm -hmm. But the point is that if it's happened once, you can then find ways of building it up and bringing it back. And I realised this is what you have to do, because when I first did all this, a long time ago, isn't it now? A long, long time ago. Um, I found I'd get the experience, and then I, I had to find out how to get this back again, how to build it up. I also found out you have to keep doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and doing it over time, and that builds something up in you. And so it actually is, it becomes slightly easier to get into it again. Um, this is experiential, this stuff. It's not, and that's why it really annoys me when people, people say, oh, this theory you've got, this is not a theory. <laughs> this is actually an attempt to enter into the lived experience. This is seeing, not a theory. There's an, I'm not explaining anything. You see, that's the important point. That's another key thing. I mean, that comes over very strongly with Goethe, but I mean, this is the later part of Wittgenstein's life. I'm going back to that a lot now because uh, I rediscovered this, uh, I'll talk about this later. Uh, um, uh, I realised that the huge influence that, that the later work of Wittgenstein had, and he said, the thing is, there's a new way of understanding which is seeing, not explaining. And he actually, we, we now know, since the 1990s, he got this from Goethe. There's this connection between Wittgenstein and Goethe's 
still not being explored properly. But he, he, the change from his early philosophy to his late philosophy came through his discovery of Goethe's scientific work, which he wouldn't ex accept as scientific. He says it's not scientific. It's, it's, it's a way of seeing. It's more important than scientific. But that's another story, anyway. Um, and this is, this is the thing. Seeing. What matters is seeing. Well, that's exactly what happened in phenomenology. If you know, the Husserl used to say when people brought up objections, and he used to say, seeing gentlemen, seeing, because I'm afraid it had to be gentlemen, there were no women in general universities at that time. Seeing gentlemen, seeing. And that's what phenomenology was. Seeing, seeing, seeing. And that's exactly what Wittgenstein did. There's a way of seeing. It's not an explanation. It's not a theory. And you won't come to it if you're trying to explain things and introducing theories. And this, is, this is why this is difficult to do. Because what I've been trying to do is to see the distinguishing. That's where I've been working on this morning. Seeing distinguishing. Not easy, is it? Okay, let's go have some coffee. That's the